So today we have two speakers. Hadar Aviram is the Thomas Miller Professor at UC Hastings College of Law, where she teaches and writes on the criminal process from a law and society perspective. She is the author of several books, the latest of which is Yesterday's Monsters, The Manston Family Cases, and The Illusion of Parole, forthcoming um, UC Press in 2020. In fact, I believe there is even a copy right here. So congratulations. Professor Avi Ram has published on domestic violence, behavioral perspectives on policing, prosecutorial and defense behavior, unconventional family units, public trust in the police, correctional policy, criminal justice policy, and the history of female crime and punishment. She served as president of the Western Society of Criminology and as a trustee of the Law and Society Association. One of the leading voices in California and nationwide against mass incarceration, Professor Avi Ram is a frequent media commentator on politics, immigration, like criminal justice policy, civil rights, the Trump administration, and the Mueller report. Her popular blog, California Correctional Crisis, covers crime and punishment in California. In fall 2009, Hadar was a visiting fellow here at the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Program, where she started working on her book-length project about direct action animal liberation activists facing criminal trials for rescuing animals from factory farms. Our second speaker, Professor Justin Marceau, is a professor of law and the Brooks Institute faculty research scholar of animal law and policy at the University of Denver. He is currently a visiting professor here at Harvard Law School. He splits his scholarship between animal law and criminal law, researching, writing, and litigating in both fields. His animal law scholarship includes his recent monograph, Beyond Cages, and his litigation includes leading the remarkably successful efforts to challenge ag-gag laws across the nation. So with that, please welcome our speakers. Hi folks, thank you very much for having us. I'm delighted to be back at Harvard and Justin is here for the semester, so many of you probably enjoy taking his, uh, his animal law class. So we're going to talk about actually two facets of how animal rights intersect with the criminal process. Uh, Justin's going to start by talking about the way that uh, we marshal criminal law to basically enforce, essentially, animal cruelty laws and, and what's wrong with that. And then I'm going to follow up talking about animal rights activists as criminal defendants and what they do with their criminal trials. Um, and we will try to be brief but illuminative and then take questions from the audience. Thank you. Right, brief and illuminative. So I thought that I would... The microphone, more or less working, you can hear me. Uh, I thought I would start, actually, with um, a passage. I don't know how many of you read uh, Professor Minow's book on restorative justice, but she starts with an interesting passage, right? She says, ours is an unforgiving age, an age of resentment. The supply of forgiveness is deficient. And then she continues and says what we all know to be true at this point. The United States is a particularly punitive in defining, prosecuting, and punishing crimes especially if the accused is a member of a racial minority. As of 2018, the United States is the most incarcerating nation in the history of humanity. And somewhat more forcefully, my, my co-speaker today, uh, Hadar said incisively, she described our criminal justice system, she's described it lots of different ways, but she described it as, quote, a veritable human rights crime of massive proportions. And I think that that's uh, sort of apt, and that's my jumping off point for thinking about the role of animal protection in this realm. And I wanted to say a couple of preliminary things. Uh, this talk I'm, I'm going to do today is, is meant to be more descriptive, right? Descriptive in the sense that uh, in the book I make a normative case, a moral case, if you will, um, against uh, some of the practices that have historically enjoyed support. But today I kind of wanted to assume less knowledge or put us all on the same page for purposes of the question and answer and sort of talk about some of the things in the last decade that have been pursued in the name of this strategy, sort of carceral animal law strategy. What does that mean, actually? Um, and it's in the shadow of, of passages like those by um, Martha Minow that I have come to believe that the investment in criminal prosecutions and also its, its siblings, like deportation, um, are not good for the movement. And the argument is not um, that the movement is primarily one that is insisting on incarceration or criminal interventions. I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think it's, it's uh, what the movement does. Um, but 
And it's also not the case that any one organization, and certainly not any one person, um, bears culpability, right? The point is not to blame. In fact, if you read the book, the point of targeting blame at someone would be um, what you would understand is a, is a red herring, right? So um, I'm actually just sort of saying, look, we should have the sort of uncomfortable conversation that Patrice Jones, an ecofeminist, said might lead to change, right? What she has said, and if, if my, as I was saying to Hadar before this, my email inbox, um, even just this morning, I got a couple of good uh, hate mail. Um, I'm not sure why. Maybe Hadar had posted something on Twitter. I'm not on social media about the talk, but it usually prompts, usually prompts someone to uh, send an angry gram my way. Um, but the way I often respond is just by noting that, you know, look, I, I don't actually think that I'm necessarily right on all of this. Right? And today I'm not even going to be taking normative positions so much. Um, but I think that sometimes having discord, this is what Patrice Jones says, leads to discomfort, and it's the discomfort that leads to conversation and maybe change, right? It's not that I have all of the answers. And in that posture, it's really the kind of traditional academic talk because uh, I'm not proposing solutions, right? I mean, the, the, maybe, maybe Hadar has some solutions and DXE, but, but I don't have answers, right? So you sort of say, well, all he's doing is, is raising problems. Fair enough. Critique is, is uh, accepted. Um, so let me talk a little bit about how it's framed, right? What are we, what are we saying? What am I even talking about when I say um, the, the, the carceral focus of animal law? Well, a good example, um, tangible example, is that the very month that my book came out, so I, I, you know, I want to say it was the same day. My wife, and I can't remember. We've tried to do this, but um, so a box of my books came, so the, the early delivery before they had come out from publisher, and something was in the mail that I got, and it included a bumper sticker, right? So um, this sort of is easily the, the motto of the movement, the abusing animal. But more strikingly, right, is just sort of this petition. And the governor's office has collected these. They're, go, they're, they're sort of turning over how many they got to them because they do a lot of animal work with the governor's office. And it was just a petition to Governor Jared Polis. It says, it's disgraceful that many, an many criminals who abuse, maim, or even kill animals are walking away with mere slaps on the wrist. I support the passage of laws in Colorado that guarantee animal abusers are punished harshly. And it sort of goes on and, and you sign your name and send it in. Right? And I don't think that most of us, certainly not me before I started this book project, would have even reacted to that. Right? It's, it's, it's of course, we don't like people who abuse animals. We want to do what we can to stop it. Um, why wouldn't mailing the governor something saying we want harsher laws be, be the right lead? Um, lots of other headlines take a similar tack, right? And, and they have this sort of bumper sticker type appeal. Um, it's a, a headline that appeared after one of the mass shootings. Quote, animal cruelty is a clear predictor of future violence. So why are perpetrators merely slapped on the wrist? And the senator sponsoring Desmond's law, which is, you know, uh, for those of you who follow legislation, spreading around the country rapidly, right? This is, this is viewed as one of the great animal law reforms, potentially, of the decade, is having victims advocates in court. Um, the sponsor of that legislation explained really candidly why she pursued it. She said that the animal protection groups had shown her that the legislation was necessary in order to ensure that animal abusers do not get soft punishments. Right? So I mean, it's very clear what the effort is, what the legislative victories look like. Uh, Mercy for Animals had been posting images of persons who had been prosecuted for animal abuse on their website in the form of mugshots. So you could go to the website and then you would see mugshots of persons. Um, and so you sort of say, wow, that's amazing. And one of them that was listed as a great victory for animals were three men, all persons of color, who had been prosecuted for their work in a slaughterhouse. Um, and what Mercy for Animals didn't note was that two of those persons weren't even prosecuted for animal abuse. They were prosecuted only for immigration-related offenses, right? For using a stolen social security number or something like that, right? So we had people being prosecuted in the name of a victory for animal abuse. And there wasn't even a cruelty event. That doesn't mean cruelty didn't occur. That's not how the criminal system works, right? It's not. But the prosecution and the convictions were not for animal cruelty. Um, more concretely, let's talk a little bit about some of the law reforms that have been achieved or that have been pursued. One of them is the Animal Abuse Registry. This is actually something I get a lot of emails about, and I'm interested in that because people say, you know, we don't even do that anymore. Animal Abuse Registries, that was a, that's a straw man. Um, and it's interesting to me because it was in 2014, I mean, the history is either changing so quickly that I can't keep up, or there's been a dramatic pivot. So 2014, New York City passed an Animal Abuse Registry. 2016, Tennessee passed a statewide registry. And from that registry, one group posted um, that they hoped Tennessee would pave the way for registries in, quote, every other state. 
Uh, right? And so, I mean, this isn't so far afield. Right? We were seeking abuse registries, and the abuse registries were modeled explicitly on sex offender abuse registries, which uh, anybody who's done any criminology work knows that those are one of the greatest examples of failures in criminal sort of justice writ large, right? Because, well, a number of reasons, but the, the short version is um, they tend to create more recidivism than they do reduce crime, right? It ends up that if you put somebody on a list and they can't go get housing, they can't uh, get a job, there's all these detriments from being listed on the website as an abuser, uh, it tends to make you uh, fall into crime more um, than, than not being on a registry, right? So, so it's not a great policy. Um, the movement has also openly pursued no-drop policies and uh, mandatory arrest policies, so the idea that you have to arrest somebody that abuses, um, the analogs here we could talk about in uh, interpersonal violence context, but it, it, it's, it's been a noted failure there as well, right? The idea that police and prosecutors would not have discretion, right? That you have to charge, you have to pursue it. Um, scholars have even argued that one of the great failures or gaps in animal law is the absence of mandatory minimums, right? So um, it has been said that the failure to include mandatory minimums in animal cruelty felony laws is one of the reasons that, that um, the society doesn't, doesn't value animals. It's also been the case that the animal protection movement has, um, in different states and at different levels, funded prosecutors, right? So um, in my book, I talk about that quite a lot. It's, it's a striking thing, and we can talk about it in the context of DXC, what it would look like to pay for a prosecutor. If Tyson Foods had a prosecutor on retainer every time they thought an activist was getting out of line, right? Even if it's not a particularly good charge, <laughs> it's very close, right? And you say, yeah. Um, I mean, even if it's not a particularly good charge, the fact of facing liability would be a real encumbrance to activists and movements, right? Um, well, here you have in Ohio and a number of states the possibility through statutory gaps to fund prosecutors on a one off basis, or in Oregon, a prosecutor is, is funded full time, right? Um, you could, again, debate. I don't know, I'm not saying I have all the answers. You could debate the merits of that. But you have to recognize that it is a massive departure from our constitutional expectation of a neutral prosecutor, to have a prosecutor whose salary is actually funded 100% by a nonprofit with a political agenda. I mean, to me, that is, that is a terrifying proposition, uh, but the animal rights movement has actually championed that. They, they broke the new ground on this. Um, also, uh, felony laws have been, historically, until they were accomplished, deemed a number one priority, right? Uh, number one priority was getting felony laws. So we could talk about the state rankings for, for hours, but imagine a state ranking system, uh, and I'm not saying this is actually what happens, sort of imagine a hypothetical system where if you didn't have a felony law, you're, but you did ban cetacean captivity, you did ban um, fur production, you did ban the sale of foie gras, and your state would still be lower on the rankings than a half dozen or more others because you lacked a felony cruelty provision for rogue acts of abuse, right? I mean, this is the sort of model we're talking about. Also, um, the animal protection movement has supported at times, right? And again, this is not to villainize anyone. I mean, I, there are many points in my life where I would have said, of course, this is obvious, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's just upon thinking about it and trying to reconcile the dissonance that, that, that I come to some of these conclusions. It's not, it's not finger pointing. The animal protection movement has pursued the prosecution of juveniles, right? Um, and again, we could say, well, maybe that makes sense in some cases. But an amicus brief was filed in Massachusetts for a decision that came out in 2017 that sought to have a 14-year-old charged as an adult, right? Uh, again, maybe five years ago or six years ago, we would have said, well, that's just sort of how America is. But 14 years old is pretty striking, right? I mean, this is, this is a departure, even if the abuse is, is, is horrible, right? Um, and to just sort of make it more clear what that means, right? the Massachusetts Supreme Court, in describing the case about pursuing juvenile prosecution as an adult made clear what it meant. They said, quote, whereas a delinquent child is subject to rehabilitative penalties and remedies, if the child is indicted and subject to adult penalties, it includes an adult sentence and state prison. Right? So the, the, the line here was, should we seek rehabilitative penalties? Well, that's what juveniles get. We could debate whether that's really what happens to juveniles. Um, but if we go adult, we know they're getting punished and they're, they're eligible for adult prison. Right? Um, so another instance of uh, sort of examples of, of policies that we might now in this room come to say, well, this is at least worth conversation, include um, immigration intervention. So one year ago in December 2018, so I guess that's a slightly more than a year, an animal protection group proclaimed victory based on an amicus brief that it filed in a case in support of ICE uh, 
called Ortega Lopez. And the organization filed the brief, characterized it as an important federal case about whether, quote, animals are victims whose suffering is unacceptable. So let me give you the context for Ortega Lopez very quickly. Um, Ortega Lopez came to this country in 1992 and has three US citizen children. Right? So he'd been in this country for a decade, more than a decade, two decades nearly, and had US children. And the government claimed that, by their own admission that he had a, quote, trivial or minor role in a single cockfighting event. So probably he was there, right, if you look at the fighting. So he probably, he attended, he didn't pay anything, he didn't pay any money. Again, not to diminish that, it's serious, right? Um, but based on that, he said, could I possibly have cancellation of my removal? Could I seek relief to not be categorically deported? Um, and I said no, and they sought amicus support from animal groups to support that decision, and the animal groups did indeed provide it, writing a brief that argued that um, harm to an animal is a crime of moral turpitude, that it has a victim, and as a crime of moral turpitude, they should not be eligible, not that they can't be deported, that they have to be deported, right? Categorically must be deported. Um, a final example is, is, is um, one of my favorites, but it's, it's more anecdotal. People don't know it. I invited a prosecutor to my animal law class in 2016 to talk about some of her work. And an example that she gave that I'll never forget, um, very attached to animals, very um, you know, empathic in many ways. She had the ability to really relate to the animals that she was trying to help. Um, she showed a picture of a, of a poodle that with matted hair um, that didn't look well. It didn't look as bad as some of the pictures of if people looked at the images that in my animal law class, like Amanda Arrington showed of, of, of dogs. But it, but it was a dog that was not looking well. Right? And she talked about how people had told her that this, there was a dog that was being mistreated. And what should she do? Well, she sent police officers to the door to ask if they could come in and see her dog. And the woman said no. And so then she sort of gave a lesson to the students that you never give up. As an animal lawyer, you have to be creative. And so what did she do? She sought an administrative warrant. So she went to the police and said, you know, this house kind of looks like shit. Um, maybe there's some sort of housing code violation inside there if we get inside. So they sent police officers to inspect for housing code violations. And while in there, they took pictures of the dog that was indeed matted in the pictures that she had revealed um, and not doing well. Then um, she showed that she prosecuted this guy. He turned out to be 86. Uh, prosecuted him and got a sentence. I don't remember. I actually emailed her recently to, to confirm the sentence length. Um, but it was somewhere in the, it was less than a year and more than six months. So, so in, that, in that neighborhood, right? So she had a, a, a very elderly person serving time in incarceration, actual incarceration time. And then, if that wasn't enough, she said, you may think that's a light sentence. And she clicked to the next slide and said, no, that's not all. And then she was able to get his house condemned. Right? Um, through this housing inspection. She sort of, you know, that's not a criminal penalty. Um, so you had someone who was literally made homeless um, by the act of enforcing uh, animal cruelty and the efforts to protect a dog. Um, so quickly, I've heard two main, um, there are many, right? Many of you could probably advance even in more sophisticated critiques, but I've heard a couple of different critiques of this project. One is that it's a solution in search of a problem because not so many people really go to jail, right? That it's, it's not that there are lots and lots of people being um, thrown in federal prison for this, so let's not worry about it. Um, and uh, let me just say a couple of things about that. First, I would just say that um, it is a problem, right? It, it is a problem even just on the examples I've given as sort of a, this is thing, these are things that have happened all in the last five years or decade in our movement. Um, they're, they're anecdotes in that sense or qualitative evidence, but it's also the case that this is how the movement is being understood by others. So other groups look at the movement and say, wow, uh, this is something that is framing itself as a civil rights group, but they are engaged in deportation, detention of juveniles, criminal interventions in marginalized communities. What does that do? What is, how does that make us feel? Um, second, you know, this is um, this effort to look mainstream in the eyes of prosecutors I mean, I could say a lot about it, but I think I, I would like to just share a quick vignette from Paul Butler on his experience as a prosecutor. Paul Butler said, quote, I was the last person my friends from law school thought would be a prosecutor, but I heard that prosecutors had all this power, so I went to try and change the system from inside. But I was overwhelmed with the workplace culture. And if anybody knows Paul Butler, he's not easily overwhelmed. So rather than change the system, the system changed me. I became a hardcore prosecutor in part 
because the incentives in the prosecutor's office are to lock people up as long as you can. Right? There is an incentive structure once you start to play in this game that doesn't look like what we normally would think of when we're talking about how do we protect animals. It's a very different culture. It's a very different set of incentives and norms, and we've kind of been swept up in that. And so this is sort of, it's, it's at least worth querying and having a conversation about. And then lastly, I would say more, more, most forcefully, people have said, you know, the problem is we don't have, uh, it, it, the criminal justice system in general, I agree, it has problems with race, it has problems with class, it's problematic overall, but we don't have any data here in this particular moment that animal cruelty prosecutions are problematic. And, um, you know, first of all, I think that it's kind of remarkable that in 2020 someone would say, unless you can prove that the criminal justice system is racialized in this context, then we probably should just proceed, right? That is, that's not where I would start with my, my assumptions. Um, I don't think that's the trajectory of modern social reform. But um, second, just as a historical matter, and I document this in the book, uh, Paula Tarenko in her dissertation that Chris Green actually put me in, in touch with, right? he had come across her dissertation, has this fascinating story, right? So we would like to tell ourselves that animal cruelty prosecutions have always just been the one area of exceptionalism, where it's race neutral and we don't have these ensnarements of prejudice and bias. But the origin story is as racist or more than anything you would find in the new Jim Crow, right? So Paula talks about the fact that the Humane Society of Washington, D.C. had, so one of the best records, kept records for an urban area that had a, a local humane society, they had long had a policy of not um, putting people in jail or incarcerating, but education and outreach. And they said this will generally, will change the hearts and minds. But when did they change from that? They changed from that only after the abolition of slavery. And so the flyers that they passed, and it wasn't coincidental, the flyers that they then started handing out in their newsletters said, the slaves, right, the former slaves are such that they have been so dehumanized that they will never learn how to treat animals right, right? So it was explicit, explicitly grounded in this idea that in the wake of a terrible thing that we've done, which is slavery, these humans are never going to know how to treat animals, right? So we've got to turn to the carceral turn. And that's, in fact, what happened. So they started promoting legislation and looking for opportunities to incarcerate, right? And then the last thing I'll say, and I'll just turn it over to Hadar, is that I've been doing some empirical work looking at um, race in this context of the animal protection movement. And two interesting findings that I'll share with you that, that I really haven't put out widely at all. I'm going to publish them in a chapter that, that, that I'm working on. Um, but there's really not any comparable data that I'm aware of. And I'd be interested, Hadar, if you've come across any as a sociologist. But it turns out that uh, persons of color, particularly Latinx persons, are overwhelmingly more likely to know someone from their community who has been prosecuted. Right? So in a study of about 1,500 persons that I conducted, um, controlling for politics, age, um, and education, and six other variables that I didn't write down, uh, Latinx persons are 3.5 times more likely than whites to know someone uh, in their community who has been, quote, accused of cruelty. It's pretty striking, right? And guess what else? The Latinx and black persons are four times more likely than whites, controlling for all these same variables, to say that the criminal response to animal cruelty is too harsh. Right? So white people know fewer people, or at least report knowing fewer people who have been accused of animal cruelty, and white people are more likely to think that the response is not too harsh. Right? So I'll end just with a quote from Patrice Jones, who I started with. She says, quote, integrity may be the central problem of our time, end quote. And by integrity, I think she means the ability to confront and not ignore dissonance and moral inconsistency. And I don't think the movement reflects its best self when it turns its back on the persons that are charged with crimes, like Hadar is talking about. It's an explicit policy of the movement, as I write in the book, to not represent these people, um, while at the same time using the criminal justice system to ensnare all these low-level um, abusers. So, thank you. So... So I want to start with uh, putting uh, some, of the, uh, some of the things that Justin said in, in, in a broader context in two ways. One of them is that the sort of these carceral problems that he's pointing out where there's a movement that's trying to do something progressive and it does it through carceral means is not unique to the animal cruelty movement. We see this all over the left. So the right has not cornered the market 
on not being carceral. We see excess in the Me Too movement. We see excess in the, in the, in the prosecutions and police violence movements. We see a lot of movements that are trying to do something good. They're trying to remedy inequalities in a lot of ways. But because in this country, all of us from right to left have been steeped for decades in this carceral logic, people don't have the imagination of coming up with better ways to solve these problems. And because the only hammer that they have is the criminal justice hammer, they only see nails. So, so, so I think that's important to keep in mind. And I think in that sense, the trend that Justin is seeing is more general. And then, as Justin said toward the end of the talk, the other side of the problem that he's pointing at is what happens when we're looking at animal rights uh, activists as defendants. So the criminal justice kind of pointed in a different direction. And that's the topic of this uh, book length project that I've been doing. I actually started it here at Harvard when I was a fellow uh, in the fall. And I'm looking at a group of people, uh, you might have heard about them as the lunging vegans this morning. So this is like the trendiest of trendiest talks about animal rights, the, the folks that uh, tackled uh, Jill Biden this morning, or Jill Biden actually tackled them, I should say. And, uh, and, and, and folks from that movement, folks from this organization, Direct Action Everywhere, is where I'm doing my ethnographic work and, and studying uh, how they're dealing with uh, cases that they face. So I'm going to start with, uh, with uh, a video, uh, and I'll tell you about it because we're, we're short on time. There's this beautiful video of uh, uh, people from this movement, Direct Action Everywhere, rescuing a little piglet from a cage. It's all very moving. The guy in the picture, his name is uh, Wayne Cheung. Uh, he used to be the leader of Direct Action Everywhere. He's now stepped, uh, stepped down because he's actually prepping for several criminal trials. He's facing charges in three different states. And uh, from their perspective, of course, the video presents this whole thing in very tender ways and, and, and talks about how they're rescuing the pig. But keep in mind that if you put on the Farm Bureau glasses, what these people are doing is trespass and larceny, both of which are state criminal offenders, uh, criminal offenses, and they face uh, pretty serious uh, charges. So what do they do? They do something called open rescue. Uh, one definition of open rescue that I've found is the process of giving aid, rescue, and veterinary treatment to animals confined in typically, uh, typical factory farm living conditions. The immediate aim of the rescuers who identify themselves even when trespass is necessary is to save lives while documented the animal suffering inherent in large scale industrialized food production. So a few things to keep in mind about open rescue. First of all, as opposed to other tactics of the movement, like for example, going underground, in a slaughterhouse or something like that. The idea is that they're not going to great lengths to conceal uh, their identities. And partly what this does is it generates sympathy for them because they're for real. They're not trying to escape the consequences. And it sort of draws the attention toward the animals. Typically, an open rescue move consists of two, uh, two components. People will be coming in, and these folks are connected to a lot of Silicon Valley tech companies. They actually have uh, 3D VR uh, uh, filming technology, so they'll go in and they'll create uh, incredibly disturbing 3D movies of what they see inside the farm. Uh, and at the same time, they're also going to pick sick animals. And they deliberately pick sick animals for, reason, for legal reasons that I'll explain in a moment, and, and also for morale reasons, and try to get them veterinary care. This is a pretty complicated operation, because if you want to give them veterinary care, you also bring them to the vet. And then you have to sort of skirt around the question of how you ended up with the pig or the chicken so that you don't get the vet in trouble also. And after that, they'll try to find a, a sanctuary for, uh, for the animals. So there's basically three things that I'm trying to do with my work or, 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 look, at, or look at them. So, so in the context of criminal trials, I, I look at the way that they're using these strategies uh, for animal liberation. And I'm looking at this movement, and I'm seeing that they're doing two things that are seemingly contradictory at the same time. So they're pursuing legal advocacy. So they actually meet with state lawmakers. They try to make the laws better. They try to uh, outlaw a lot of the practices in the, in the field. And in that respect, they're well, maybe more like the folks Justin was talking about. And at the same time, they're engaging in these law-breaking tactics to sort of uh, change, uh, change the movement. Now, within criminal justice constraints, like a lot of what they're doing is they're trying to seek legal engagement with law enforcement in a pretty sophisticated way. So when they plan an operation like that, they're not trying to not get caught. They're trying to actually come in contact with law enforcement but in a very strategic way that is going to garner them the kind of political victory that they're looking for. And what they're doing is two, pretty, uh, two things that are seemingly contradictory, but when you think about them, they're not that contradictory. So on one hand, and we're going to see this, uh, in all the communiques about what they're doing, they're really downplaying the criminal nature of what's going on. So you'd be reading this, and you could be forgiven for mistaking what's going on, which is actually a criminal prosecution, for a civil landmark lawsuit for the hashtag right to rescue. So there's this idea of presenting this as a pseudo-constitutional case, 
rather than what it actually is, which is a criminal case. At the same time, they do rely on the criminal framing, but they rely on it in a sort of ironic way, in kind of like a, we are not the real criminals here, the real criminals are the people that are accusing us. So, so there's these, these two things that are, uh, that are going on at, at the same time. So the organization itself is called DXE, uh, Direct Action Everywhere. They have uh, uh, chapters all over the world. Uh, they do have a chapter here in Boston, uh, but the, the kind of like the, the headquarters is in Berkeley, so very close to where I work. And they do all kinds of things. They also do a lot of nonviolent direct action. Some of it is the Jill Biden stuff that you saw this morning. They'll be going into Whole Foods and staging a funeral for the turkeys. Um, they make a point, and we can talk about the wisdom of this tactic, to specifically target people that are actually closer to them ideologically. So they'll be targeting restaurants where you're thinking, like, why are they targeting Chipotle that actually has vegan options? But the idea is that they think that by attacking people that are closer to them ideologically, they're going to create this domino effect where they gradually get more people on board uh, with the cause. And, and, and I talked just before this talk about some people saying, well, why are these people attacking Bernie? And I said, a lot of them are pretty rabid Bernie fans. And this is specifically why they're trying to specifically attack Bernie in his campaign. So that's a, sort of an interesting thing. There's also a, a big social component to what's going on. People that are very dedicated radical activists don't really have friends outside of the movement. They live in commune houses in Berkeley. So they live with each other. They eat with each other. They socialize with each other. So their whole lives, even if they have day jobs, revolve around, uh, around their, their activist uh, lives. So let me talk a little bit about uh, kind of like how they frame what they're doing. So these are some of, uh, some of the folks I'm studying uh, protesting. So in general, as you all know, just using the term animal rights is complicated. And people have written a lot of complicated jargony theoretical papers. Some of them, excuse me, are probably sitting in this room about kind of like whether we should use the term rights or whether it makes sense or, or what have you. But it is a politically useful tool because lots of movements that use or employ the term rights are doing it for a strategic reason because we've come to see rights movements as sort of the, the approach that gets things done. And basically what DXE do is they do exactly this. So they have this 40-year uh, plan. You, you can see it on their website. They have a roadmap of what they're going to do for animal liberation. The end goal that they're looking for is a legal goal. They want a constitutional amendment that defines animal rights. That's the, the, the ultimate goal. And the way to get there is to do two things at the same time, to gradually decrease the acceptability of making, producing, and consuming animal products, while at the same time increase the acceptability of open rescue. So both of these things are happening at the same time, which is why the framework is actually not contradictory, because seeking legality through legality and through law breaking at the same, point, at the same time is getting them to the same place. But keep in mind that if you're breaking the law and you're you know, tackling Jill Biden on stage, if you want to then have credibility when you go to lawmakers, you have to sort of like constantly work on actually having legitimacy to show up. And this is one of the great ironies of this movement that they somehow succeed in doing this despite the fact that they're doing these very theatrical, flamboyant, uh, and, and maybe arguably embarrassing things. Um, here's some of the things that they do within legality. So when they're not open rescuing, they've actually succeeded in passing the San Francisco fur ban, which later became the California fur, fur ban. They were fairly, uh, uh, fairly instrumental in getting the ban to pass. Uh, uh, they've been working with state legislators and putting together legislature that's supportive of them. They have gotten several city councils in the Bay Area to uh, adopt resolutions. I mean, of course, this is symbolic, but it does, it does matter overall for the goal. Adopting resolutions that uh, say, this is the right to rescue. We support you. We do not support the prosecutions against you. And they're trying to fight laws that the Farm Bureau is trying to push on them that are hostile to open rescue. We can talk about those in the Q&A uh, if we have time. So what do they do with an open rescue? So this is kind of a bearing witness thing. Uh, um, and uh, in, in a lot of ways, what they're doing is they're doing something that's illegal, but they do have to have a legal beard to some extent, or some sort of legal leg to stand on. This is partly where I come into this, because when they break into these farms, uh, and the sheriff comes to arrest them, they show the sheriff this, this one pager that I hastily wrote for them a couple of years ago about the necessity defense and why it arguably uh, uh, applies to what they're doing. Uh, they will typically alert law enforcement before they plan to do something like that because they want to make sure they've exhausted all the legal avenues before they do it. They do use, they make efforts to evade detection. So the fact that kind of like it's done openly is, is only part of the story because if you actually want to get the footage and rescue the animals, you, only ha you have to avoid being apprehended at least until you've achieved those goals. So that means you sneak in and you come in at night. And you use technology because they have found that these 3D movies are pretty effective. Next time there's a vegan fair in Boston or something, you should go and see if they're tabling and they have the VR sets. And you can see one of the movies. They're, they're, they're quite, uh, quite uh, stunning. 
Uh, and then they'll rescue the animals. They will deliberately pick uh, poor or sick animals, and they never leave without taking at least one animal. There's a couple of reasons for this. One of them is that they're planning to argue the necessity defense, and they can argue that there's a, a, a imminent harm to the animal only if the animal is really sick. Although, as we know, many animals face imminent danger in, in, in factory farms. But the other thing is that doing this work is hard and demoralizing, and you experience horrors when you do this. And so you have to at least manufacture for yourself a little bit of a Disney end, because otherwise this work is just so depressing that you have to like add a component of hope to what you're doing. And again, they anticipate arrest, they come prepared, they make their arguments to the sheriff, and, uh, and they have various ritual and theatrical things that they do when uh, law enforcement does, uh, does show up. So then when they prepare for trial, they need to find legal representation and they need support. If you go on Facebook and you look at what they're doing, you see how long I have left. Do, 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 do. Oh, we're good. Uh, so when they'll go to court, typically what you'll see is people making arguments that uh, they are pursuing a legalization of the hashtag right to rescue. So we're not criminals, we're people pursuing a landmark case and we need your help. So that's how they seek donations. And they're also looking for legal representation showing that they're fairly, um, fairly sympathetic people. Now this is true, these are very sweet you know, nonviolent folks, you know, they meditate in jail, they're like, you know, it's, it's they're, they're folks that elicit a lot of sympathy, not necessarily from the mainstream animal rights movement, but as I'm going to say at the end of today, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because it does achieve some goals, except it's not exactly the goals that, they, that they're looking for explicitly. So, uh, so the, the lawyers that they do manage to get are not people from the movement, and this is because people from the movement will say, look, Criminal law is very specialized. We are not criminal lawyers. We're animal rights lawyers. I've interviewed lawyers and asked them, like, why would you represent this? This is an animal rights case. And people have said to me, it's not an animal rights case. It's a criminal case, which requires special criminal expertise that I do not have. And I'm afraid that somebody's going to go to prison, and I don't want to make a soapbox at that expense. Except a, so a soapbox is exactly what they want. So they're looking for criminal lawyers that also have the flexibility to see that there's political goals here that are not necessarily a legal acquittal or a dismissal of the charges. In fact, if the prosecutor quietly dismissed the charges, they'd be quite gutted because they wouldn't really get what they're trying to get out of this, which makes being a criminal lawyer of people like this pretty complicated. Like think about some of the work that the National Lawyers Guild does. It's kind of like along, along the, same, the same ways. So when they come to trial, they want to argue uh, the necessity defense. This is uh, some of the elements. That, uh, the necessity defense is not really codified in a lot of these states. This is, I've just, I fished it out of the criminal jury instruction. So as you can see, the requirements for the necessity defense are rather narrow. It really has to be an emergency. It consists of this idea that you balance the harms. So they'd have to show that the harm to the animal is greater than the harm perpetrated by the trespass and the larceny. And of course, whether this is convincing or not depends on whether you're wearing your DXE glasses or your Farm Bureau glasses. Because if you wear your DXE glasses, you're like, well, this is life and death. If you don't know, you've put on the Farm Bureau glasses, these people are taking property. So, so it's actually questionable whether this is a successful tack. And we can talk more about that uh, uh, in the, in the Q&A. So they encounter all kinds of challenges. First of all, in general, courts have become rather hostile to people trying to make these kinds of political arguments, and that's, and that's really tough. Uh, they're facing uh, legislation that's pretty hostile to them, and they're dealing, for the most part, because they do this in farming counties, they're dealing with farming jurors in those farming counties. And that's difficult to sell. Now, I find it interesting, uh, uh, Justin just mentioned the idea of kind of like the prosecutors working for the animal rights organizations. In some of these counties, there's so little crime that the prosecutor actually is not a prosecutor full time. And during the time that they don't prosecute, they actually consult for the Farm Bureau. So yeah, theater of the absurd. So there's that. Um, they are packing the courtroom and they are advertising. So part of the field work is I'm uh, starting to go to the pretrials, which are starting to happen this month. And I'm actually asking myself whether the activists packing the court is useful or counterproductive. Like I'm not sure that a good selling point for, for the rural jury is seeing like you know, a sea of you know, chanting people in, in blue shirts, but again, it depends on whether you're trying to have a legal victory or a political victory. Then there's the question of how people look at the, the, the possibility that they might actually go to prison. So when you interview people, which is what I'm doing for this project, and you ask them, like, what do you think about the prospect of going to, going to jail? Uh, people will say things like, you know, we are part of this rich legacy. We're just like the, uh, the lunch counter protesters from the 1960s, and we're continuing that legacy. We're part of this legacy of civil disobedience. And, which is kind of interesting, and, and maybe uh, that's kind of like a social movement point, 
Like with any progressive group of people that use social media, there are a lot of splinters and internal fights. And that means that some people are just so exhausted of arguing with each other that people have said to me, I'm actually looking forward to jail if it happens because I need some peace and quiet. To which I said, apparently you don't know California jails. So, you know, best of luck to you. But one of the really interesting things that people have said is that, you know, I'm gonna, one of the activists, the guy that has the Santa Rosa pretrial uh, at the end of this month has said, whatever I'm gonna suffer is nothing compared to what the pigs are suffering. And actually there's something about kind of like my going through this experience that links, like in, enhances my empathy with the animals that I'm saving. So there's this co-becoming logic to that. Now I'll end with this. First of all, in general, I think that one of the takeaways from this is that we have to take criminal law into account when we try to define politics or social movement work. This is not new to this context. This is something we've, knows, we've known since Rosa Parks and before Rosa Parks that this is important. The other thing, I think for the activists, it's important to figure out what, what, what is actually useful for the movement. And, and, and this is crucial because the activists are really hoping that the mainstream of the animal rights movement is going to embrace them. But in many ways, the rights movement not embracing them is actually more helpful. Because the animal rights movement is pointing to DXC and saying, well, you have to talk to us and negotiate better conditions for the animals because we are not crazy like those other people. This is known in social movement theory as the radical flank effect. And I think it's not exactly in the way that they think, but they're actually doing a great service to the movement by serving as the, the foil or the crazy people compared to humane society or, 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 or other groups. Uh, and then finally, of course, there's the, the interest of the non-humans in the story, the factory, farm, uh, the factory farmed animals. And that's that if we use a variety of techniques, including law-breaking techniques, this is one situation where actually being diverse, there's room for lots of kinds of activism in this movement, and this is just one of many tactics that we can employ that can be, uh, that can be marshaled to, uh, to improve uh, 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 how animals fare in general in the country. So I'm gonna stop there to give, uh, to give us all uh, time for some questions. Let me get out of here. And we're happy to, we're happy to hear what you guys think. <laughs> oh. Hi, uh, my question is for uh, Justin. Um, you mentioned how many um, uh, activist groups are taking a, a period of a carceral approach, even to you know slaughterhouse workers and, and the like. That's interesting. You say that because from some of the things I've seen, um, you know, there have been there have been you know reports by nonprofits talking about some labor conditions in slaughterhouses and such. And I've seen groups take the opposite approach, where they say we don't we don't want to look at slaughterhouse workers as the enemies. They're not. They're not the problem, it's a system that's a problem, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if you've seen any groups or heard any groups say stuff like that, but how do you, I'm just curious, how would you uh, jibe some of your findings and some of the things you cited versus some of the things that I've sort of heard and I assume you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That. I mean, it's a great question. I, I think that the, the short answer is that, that that evolution is is quite recent. So recent, in fact, that in litigating cases in the last half decade, you would see labor unions not being willing to team up with the animal rights movement because they see them as antithetical to what the worker, the worker position. So, you know, when Animal Outlook and other groups say, well, we're, we're trying to find opportunities to work with the workers, that's true. I mean, I've contacted labor organizers on behalf of some of those groups that, that I think it's earnest, right? But you have, to, you have to imagine that if you're coming at this where you have literally incarcerated persons at these factory farms, had them deported for decades, and turn around and be like, we're actually here, we're, we're interested in doing a campaign to help uh, working conditions in slaughterhouses. Uh, it looks instrumental. It doesn't look like you are actually looking for some sort of intersectional um, collaboration, right? So it's, it's easy to say we're, we're here for worker, we're worker conditions if that happens to uh, facilitate a case or an instrumental objective. It's much harder to create a movement where you are inclusive of those interests. And so, that, I mean, but I, I think that the people who are doing it, not, I'm not saying anyone is disingenuous. Um, but I think that there's, there's a history underlying this, and part of it is, is criminal, and part of this is, um, is, is race and class based. Um, thank you very much. This was very, very interesting. Um, my question is for Professor Aviram. Um, with respect to the radical flank effect, I wonder um, if the, there's some sort of um, maybe 
like unintended painting of the entire movement as uh, you know, including the supposedly moderate humane society of the U.S. or some such thing as um, you know, coterminous with this radical flank. Um, for example, my friend, apropos you're saying this is timely, sent me that today, uh, the video of Jill Biden and also of, uh, I guess there were topless protesters of Bernie Sanders yes. and um, sort of said like, what are you doing in this animal movement? Like, why are you part of this? Something like that. So, so, so I'm really glad you asked that because um, one of the things that I'm looking at, because I, I'm looking at this partly from a social movement lens, is I'm looking at dissenters writing about why they left DXC. Yeah. And, part of it is, and part of it is just like embarrassment. People are like, I don't want to be associated with this. It's like, it's, it's, it's mortifying to me that this is getting press and, and I can't deal with it. I mean, certainly the, the Joe Biden and the topless stuff, but I mean, even staging a public action in a place like Whole Foods can be very embarrassing for people that participate in it if it's you know, done the way it's done. Um, and, and I do get the sense, just from seeing sort of the correspondence and kind of like who rushes to apologize for things like this, that the more moderate animal rights organizations, like whenever something like this happens, everybody's in a rush to distance themselves from that. So you're going to see like PETA dumping on them, you know, and, and the funny thing is everybody also dumps on PETA. Like the funny thing about the radical flank event is everybody kind of like who's standing to the center is pointing at, the, at whoever's standing to the left of them and saying, we're not like that. So, so you see this effort and to some extent, it's, it's good that that happens overall for the movement. I mean, of course, for, in, for various individuals, it's not great, but the advantage of it is that people get social capital from distant, distancing themselves publicly from that. I will tell you that there's a new Twitter handle as of this morning called Lunging Vegans, and they are feasting on this, which is kind of funny, because you're like, you're, you're the butt of the joke for everybody else, but they're actually turning the joke around, and they're like, we don't want four more years of Trump, but we also don't want animal products, and, and it's very jocular, it's very fun, they're sort of trying to use this. It's people that are very committed to the goal, they feel they have nothing to lose, they don't have a lot of social capital investment outside of the movement, and, and, so, there's, and so there's a lot of kind of like in-group validation for what they're doing. Yeah. And I would just add, Andy, I mean, I think it's, it's, your point is so good, but this comes up in cases. This, I mean, judges will say, you know, I mean, I just read this morning about, you know, whatever happened. I mean, is, is, this, is this some of these plaintiffs? Is this, um, I mean, and you know, it's what Hadar said. I mean, there's, in the social change literature, there is really this strong notation of you need the outlaw in order to have the in-law. Like, you can't have mm -hmm. the in-law success if you don't have the outlaw element. Right? They're, 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 mm -hmm. they, are, they are compatible. So it looks bad, right? Um, but I think that there is, I mean, this is, this is pretty well documented. And, and for what it's worth, DXC do the same thing. They're saying we're not right. like the ALF. <laughs> exactly. Right? We're not bombing labs. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's right. Well, I have a question. Uh, so this is for Hadar. As someone who has spent a lot of um, you know, time, has relationships, ethnographic research with DXC, what is your take on the perception by some people that it's um, a cult? So for instance, I'm, as you know, Carol Adam will not speak right. at an event with DXC right. because she said, I don't want to risk accidentally bringing people to, who come to see me into a cult. So um, you, you're talking to the right person because I've just given a lot of thought to cults <laughs> in another context. And uh, what is a cult depends a lot on who's looking outside of, of, of the cult and kind of like how to deconstruct what a cult is. Um, I think a lot of what we're seeing in these controversies, and by the way, after Carol Adams wrote this kind of like feminist takedown of what's going on, uh, there, were about, there were a few dozen people that exited DXC on account of grievances related to that. I think a lot of this is just very basic and fundamental differences in style among progressive movements, and we see a lot of these splintering in other contexts as well. So there will be the folks that are very intent and it's very important for them to call out instances of racism and misogyny, and they think that that's the way to deal with it. And DXC has very consciously, their leadership has, has chosen not to go that way. And that's, a, that's an, an interesting decision given that most of progressive activism, and a lot of these people are activists in, in other progressive contexts, that's kind of like the, 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 the go-to tactic, right? And DXC is like, no, we're all about call in. If you think that somebody says something that's racist or transphobic, you go and quietly talk to them. And they'll argue, you know, we've handled the sexual harassment situation by 
quietly talking to the person and tell them do not ever show your face in DXE again, but that was not enough for the people that were seeking a more public repudiation of what happens. And there, there's also factual disputes about what exactly is happening with kind of like the internal policing of the organization. Like everything else, you get a lot of different versions of what happened, and it's kind of hard to tell. I can definitely see how people coming into this will, will see cultish elements. I mean, just to give you an example, uh, so one of the things that DXC propagates is something called the Liberation Pledge, which is you wear a fork on your wrist and you vow you're not going to sit at a table where animal products are, are being served. I mean, for a lot of the people in this room who associate with people that are not vegans, that means alienating yourself from a big portion of your social circle. But because a lot of these folks don't have a lot to lose and they hang out with vegans, they've created this alternative social scene. They have their own 4th of July, they have their own Thanksgiving, they have their own thing. For somebody looking at this from the outside, it certainly looks like a cult and I can understand that perspective. I can also see why people that are really invested in this movement are saying like, I found my people, you know, I don't want to interact with this like scary meat eating world. And, but the outcome of this is that people won't have holidays with their families, which certainly gives rise to these kinds of accusations. So, so there is a lot of sort of light and shadow in, in how this works, and this is partly what makes these people fascinating to me. I have one comment and one question. Uh, I believe religion plays a very important role. Oh. Religion plays a very important role in animal treatment. In a country like India, which is quite democratic, as well as surrounding authoritarian countries, thousands and thousands of animals are sacrificed on the religious festivals a day. And even if the lawmaker were to be a total vegan or vegetarian, they are very concerned that to be re-elected in the election, they do not pose laws curbing such sacrifice. In one particular state, they did post law, implemented a law, that there should not be any animal sacrifice during religion, in temples. But people became very unhappy, and that particular party did not get power back. So here is, such situations exist in many countries. Mm -hmm. So do you know any kind of animal rights activity in authoritarian countries? Sorry, and is the question specifically whether the authoritarian government is imposing an animal rights agenda? Uh, it, no, what I mean, for example, this is a free country. So you do find animal activity like in California. Sure. What I'm asking is whether such activity have you heard of in, in an authoritarian country uh -huh. where in fact, you know, people may be harmed instead of being just jailed. Right. So no. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I have, so, there's definitely, there's definitely like very strong pockets of activism in, for example, China. I mean, there are, I mean, you have this sort of trope of, of China and, and dog for that. There are remarkable like activist organizations there that are risking um, considerable punishment and, you know, life and limb. And, and I think that's true in, in other nations too. I, I don't, I'm not, I don't have that background, but it, it definitely is true that they exist outside of um, democracies. And, and I should say, there are people in the room that are far more qualified than me yeah. to talk about the international context because my study is limited to the domestic context. I will tell you that one of the things, one of the outreach aspects that the activists do is they try to look at sort of unlikely allies. Like for example, in San Francisco, the best vegan restaurants are owned by cults. The Sri Chimnoy cult has a vegan restaurant, the Supreme Master cult has a restaurant, and they're constantly thinking like, do we have some like untapped resource in the form of the disciples of these things that we can, but imagining the Sri Chimnoy people marching with DXC is kind of hard because they're people that are very, very different from each other. So, so making these coalitions where there's such cultural differences is not an easy thing. But, but again, I, I defer to the, the much vaster expertise of people sitting in this room right now. Uh, I got a quick question for each of you. Um, Justin, you know, Boston was the site of uh, the this what's known as the puppy doe incident, where there was a dog that was a puppy that was like brutally tortured, tongue slit, all this terrible stuff happened, left in a playground where children children might have found it. That then spurred a, a backlash of uh, you know of, of animal a wave of animal protection legislation. Um, 
but there's a lot of people who feel really strongly about that. And I wonder what, what it, instead of incarceration or, or criminal punishment, what, what you would recommend, because there was just a lot of public angst, like something needs to happen to this person. And to Hadar, my question to you is just following up on, on Andy's question about just the efficacy of these sort of bum rushing these stages because they never get to the mic, they seldom do, or unless they rip it out, of, you have a white male ripping it out of Kamala Harris's hands, which looks great. Uh, but you know, no one's ever, afterwards, no one's ever talking about, oh wow, we should really consider the plight of dairy cattle. They're like, look at these crazy people who are, we need more secret service protection for Joe sure. Biden. I mean, that's all you're hearing. You're not, mm -hmm. the message actually never gets through, just the crazy, it seems, all it gets through. So I just wonder what their internal perspective is on what they believe the actual efficacy sure. of it is. Sure. Yeah, I mean, quickly, I, I, mean, I mean, my take is not, so two things, right? One, it's not um, an abolition take at this point. It's not, it's not decriminalization. So um, you respect the fact that the existence of law does, at least according to some, some data, create a deterrent, right? That you would have less animal abuse because you have the law in place. Um, you know, beyond that, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of questions, right? Like, what would we do? Well, what would we do if we imagined all kinds of different Rawlsy in first positions, right? What would I do? I mean, I thought it was fascinating when Hadar said she talked to the uh, lawyers in the movement. He said, well, we don't take these cases because we're not trained in it. Well, that doesn't stop them from taking lots of cases that are outside of their areas of expertise. Mm -hmm. They can tell you that. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, we don't, we don't do that. Well, um, you know, you could hire a defense lawyer if you wanted to, right? I mean, we, we fund these, but we don't want to. And the same is true in this, right? You could invest resources instead of in, in trying to get a registry passed. If you, took, if you diverted just the money that the organizations had spent in the aggregate toward trying to get a registry to treatment and rehabilitation programs, we don't even know. The sky is the limit, right? I mean, there are programs now that are trying to look into this, but it's costly and it takes time. It doesn't happen in six months. It doesn't happen in a year. And we're so far behind that curve because we have been wrapped up in this other agenda. So I don't know exactly what we would do, but I would say some of the resources would go towards it focusing on true individualized assessments and then assessment-based um, treatment and interventions. And, and I will say very briefly, because I know we have to dash out of here, uh, <laughs> it depends on who you ask. I think there's a generational gap within the movement where the younger people tend to be less reflective. I mean, the 21-year-old guy that grabs Kamala Harris's microphone is obviously has some ego invested in all this, and he's not looking at the bigger picture. But when you talk to someone like Wayne, who's been around for a long time and it's a little bit older, he will very candidly tell you, like, I actually don't mind being the clown of California. Yeah. It's, if, if it's going to get us to the place we need to go in animal liberation, that's where it's going to go. I mean, Wayne, Wayne introduces himself to people and he says, I'm a really boring person. I wake up in the morning and all I think about is how to save animals. I think they're anything but boring. But I think for, for the kind of like the older, more reflective people who don't have ego invested in this, it's, it's actually true. Okay. okay, well, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you.